Thank you very much, Emma, um, and thank you for um, inviting me to speak today. Really looking forward to um, engaging with everyone. So as you can see from the slide, uh, my name is Rebecca Nestor and I'm um, on the board of the Climate Psychology Alliance, which has been working for 10 years or so on what are the um, uh, psychological impacts of what we used to call climate change and now many of us calling the climate crisis. Um, and I have an interest in how those psychological impacts relate to how we talk about climate change and how we communicate climate change. And um, you can see that our strapline is facing difficult truths. And this is this is a very, um, I think, a very powerful statement about the about the difficulty of climate change um, at a psychological level for for all human beings. Um, and um, I'm going to say a little bit about those difficulties and then I'm going to, to focus on what we can do at a, at a kind of human level to connect with each other and to communicate well um, at, a, at a conversational level. So um, most of what I'm going to say is about those situations where we are we are just two people in a room or on a teams um, and we're trying to connect with each other. We're trying to think together about what's what's needed around the climate crisis. Um, and that I think um, it relates to sustainability. But often when we're thinking about sustainability, we're talking, we're looking at solutions. We're trying to talk about solutions. My, my argument is in part that we need actually to look at what's going on under the surface around people's responses to like the reasons we need sustainability practices in the first place. Um, so uh, if we could have the next slide, please, Emma, and I hope this is not causing any COVID flashbacks for anyone when I say that. Um, so, yeah, climate change is hard to talk about if you could um, move to the next transition. Um, the first the first reason it's hard to talk about is because um, of a multiplicity of social reasons. So. Um, at one level, we, we we don't talk about it. It's just it's too hard. There is a kind of unstated, please don't spoil my day going on around uh, talking about climate change, um, sometimes known as a socially constructed silence. And then there are all those other things which have really come up, um, I guess, in particular, I think, in the last three or four years around the increased polarisation on talking about climate change. Um, the image you can see is um, an Extinction Rebellion protest from two or three years ago with the, the papier mache elephant in the room, but it also signifies polarisation because what we've got is um, uh, uh, many, many people taking um, non-violent direct action, in some cases a bit, bit more violent direct action, and in, in, in other cases feeling really kind of hostile to that and, um, and feeling it as a threat. Um, not, not to mention all the misinformation that is so well funded um, and, the, and the power differences um, in terms of access to money, resources, uh, decision makers and so on. And it, that those, those social aspects combine to make talking about climate change at a human level feel really threatening um, and so often we just don't. So the second reason it's difficult um, is often, um, and if we can have the next transition please Emma, is often because, um, because climate science is a science, um, we, we may often believe that if we could only get the information across better, then people would get it and people would, the scales would fall from their eyes and they would do what's needed. Um, and so some of us might go into lecture mode when we're having those conversations. Um, others who may be feeling they don't quite, we don't quite know enough, might just be silenced by that because I better not get into that because everybody knows more than I do. Um, and so again, there's a kind of, there's a kind of silencing effect of that. But there can also be, I think, um, a sense, perhaps a perception of people who are talking um, and perhaps going into lecture mode as being um, somehow seen as, you know, a bit preachy um, or a bit, um, a bit nerdy. Um, and given that climate change is uh, the, the biggest collective problem that has faced society in history, um, it needs to be not restricted to the nerds. It needs to be something that we can all talk about. Um, and so then the third area, please, Emma, 
is is relationships. Um, so relationships at work, relationships at home, family, friends, and so on, um, and the perhaps the power dynamics at work, but also those those things of how you're seen. Are you seen as the one who always goes on about sustainability or climate change? Are you seen as um, the one who is is um, unable to think about anything else? Are you seen um, conversely as the person who doesn't care? Um, we we tend to, I think, put each other into into those kinds of boxes. Do you care or don't you care? When actually, perhaps it's a, it's a bit more complex than that for all of us. But in relationships, we tend to you know, put people into categories. Are you someone who cares or doesn't care, wants to work on this, doesn't want to work on it? Um, and then, of course, you've got those um, those long-standing historical relationships as well. So that the picture you can see there is me and my sister when I was five and she was four. Um, and look, you know, my mother's dressed us the same and we were both wearing these nice little dresses, but we used to get into absolute fights all the time. And those kinds of relationships are all, we're still carrying them into adulthood, adulthood even though I'm going to be 60 later this month. So those are maybe some of the reasons, and I hope you can also maybe share some other reasons why you might find it difficult um, if you do, and please use the chat for that. And apologies that I can't, I, I can't easily see the chat because I can't make Teams work on my laptop and I'm joining on my phone, which is why Emma's doing all the tech for me. Um, but please do share that with each other. So yeah, if we could, if we could move on to the next slide, please, Emma. Um, when things are hard to talk about, sometimes it's because we are um, we're struggling with underlying feelings. Um, and the the argument that I'm making and that many climate psychologists make, not not everyone, but um, but but many, is that actually climate change evokes some pretty strong, difficult feelings in everybody. And all of us have defences of one kind or another to manage those difficult feelings because it's what humans do. And so I'm not saying there are some people who are in denial and there are other people who've woken up. Um, what I'm saying is we all need to be in denial at one level or another because the idea of human beings changing the climate is, um, is hard. It's hard to manage. Um, and so we, we mobilise our psychological defences. What you can see on the image there is the Anthony Gormley sculpture of his newborn baby, which he made, I think, in the mid 90s when his son was born. Um, and I think it's a very powerful image of the vulnerability of, of the baby. Um, and some of those vulnerable feelings are still there in us as adults. And, um, and also the, the defence that the baby has grown there, the iron skin, if you like, the um, the hard edges that mean that they don't feel completely swamped by the um, by the difficult feelings. Um, and my, my my proposal to you all is that if we can understand those feelings and pay attention to them and be brave enough to um, to, to 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 sit with them, it can help us to communicate meaningfully. Um, and I'm just if I can have the next slide, I'm just going to segue off a little bit into something that's a little bit more of a kind of social aspect of this. Um, still from the same area of psychology that um, I'm talking about, there is this idea that we, um, we're not um, straightforward, monolithic um, uh, people with, with one way of thinking and being. We all have both um, caring parts of ourselves and uncaring parts of ourselves. Sometimes we are we're moved to tears by what we can see in a, um, a nature documentary or um, uh, talking to someone else about climate change. Um, other times we just want to be left alone and we don't want to have to be made to think about it. And that's entirely normal and um, not something to be to be critical of. But what we what some people are arguing is that the culture we live in um, actually encourages the uncaring parts, it encourages us to feel that we're entitled to um, an extremely comfortable life way beyond what most people in the world have ever experienced, um, that we're entitled to um, uh, continue to extract fossil fuels um, and, and no matter the impact on, on the earth. 
an in the service, if you like, of capitalism, of the of the way our society works. So it encourages us to be uncaring so that we can continue buying things. Um, and I would argue that having climate conversations with other people in the workplace, at home, wherever you have an opportunity, um, can be can be part of fostering um, a culture of care as opposed to the culture of uncare. Um, and Sally Weintraub, who wrote the book that you can see, um, I would really recommend her and the book in general. It's it's a it's a good read. It's not um, uh, it's well informed without being um, obscure. So I'd, I'd, I'd um, encourage you to have a look at that if you can. So what this is my this is my kind of argument, if you like. And so what I'm going to go on to say is something about what what can we do about this? How can we um, maybe change the kinds of conversations we have? So if I can have the next slide, please, Emma. This is an image of a, um, a flipped iceberg and um, the the proposal I'm making to you is that generally speaking in conversations we see the top of the iceberg we see what we see the white bit um, and that is the content the words um, the we are here to talk about climate change or we are here to talk about sustainability proposals um, the words that are being used but what's going on under the surface of all of that and what would happen if we started to look at that um, as well as to, took it as seriously as we take the words so if you think of the, the top of the iceberg being the content, um, the rest of it, what's underneath, is what psychologists often call process. Um, so for example, um, what's the mood? Are you, are you feeling anxious? Are you feeling frightened? Are you feeling under threat? Are you feeling um, excited? Uh, are you feeling connected with the other person? What is, what is the mood? What do you think they're feeling? Um, what is the what is the agenda, the the under the surface agenda? If you're having a conversation about sustainability, it's quite likely that the other person might be having might have an agenda, which is how soon can I get out of this? How soon can I get away? Um, what you know, how 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 painful is it is this going to be? They might be asking or how much am I going to have to change? Um, and how much, you know, and so their agenda might be to kind of finish off the conversation, to agree maybe a little bit too quickly um, or to just say this is all completely impossible. Um, and we might ask ourselves as well, what's our own agenda? Because sometimes when I have conversations with um, with colleagues, what I want to do is convince them of my perspective. That's actually my agenda. Um, and sometimes along the way, I might be wanting that they feel a little bit guilty or they feel a bit bad for the fact that they haven't taken this seriously. And so I'm I'm kind of maybe, if I'm really honest with myself, wanting to get that across too, that, to get them to realise how wrong they have been. Um, and I think that sometimes that agenda can be really felt by the other person in a way that we might not be aware of. And so it's just worth thinking, you know, what am I going into this conversation for? And then finally, um, finally under the surface is the is the perceptions. Um, you know, if I grew up having fights with my sister, am I am I perhaps going to carry some of those um, experiences into relationships at work? Am I going to be seeing someone who's about the same age as me as a bit of a threat, a bit somebody who's who I'm in competition with? Am I going to find it necessary to get one over on them um, to show them that I'm, I actually know more than they do? Um, and are they going to see something like that in me? Are they going to see me as someone who's coming in to preach, coming in to tell them what to do, coming in to be mum, for example? Lots of different family roles that can that can come into this. Um, so if we are if if we pay attention to those aspects of experience rather than the words that people are using, we we I find we get to a really different place. So if we can have the next slide, please, Emma. Because the first thing is really, really to listen and to ask. Um, it's about saying, um, you know, what do you feel about this? What's your what's what's your take on it? And really listening beyond the point at which they say, oh, it's it's fine or it's a real problem, but just really let them continue to speak so that some of the feeling level stuff comes out and you can maybe listen to it and maybe hear it and maybe reflect it back to the person. 
Um, I would argue as well, and I'd be really interested to hear what my two panel colleagues would say about this, that it's very important to acknowledge the scale of the issue, because if we don't do that, we're kind of colluding with the collective silence um, and it enables us to go into the space of how do we feel about this, this huge thing that is happening, uh, which creates better connections. Um, and then the, the third key area is about recognising when people are amb ambivalent. So when they're saying things like it's all very complicated and yes, but, or some of those things like it's probably too late, um, there's no point, what about China? Um, we're screwed, um, which I think people are saying more and more, those kinds of things, which are kind of also, as well as being maybe true in terms of how people are feeling, there may also be uh, a way of pushing out the conversation. And, you know, the real life, I have got other things to worry about. So there's a whole load of um, ways in which ambivalence gets gets expressed. And what I think we can do is we can name the fact that everybody has some of that. And we don't need to be say, to be seeing it as some kind of turning away altogether, but just just, uh, you know, uh, agreeing and listening and being and, and being able to explore that together. Maybe naming the feelings very tentatively, you know, it sounds as if you feel it sounds as if this is um, this. This feels like this for you um, and just keep asking the other person to just say a bit more and going on doing that beyond the point at which you think, really, I've got to have my message here. I've got to get my point across because that feeling is what gets in the way of having the actual conversation. So I would say um, go to that, get, go to that place where you're thinking, uh, when is it going to be my turn? Go a bit beyond it and then and then say, OK, can I tell you what my perspective is? Um, and you can then explore that together. It's slower, but more productive than the kinds of conversations where we're going in talking about what it is you need to understand. Um, and believe me, I've had all of those conversations as well. So just to end with the last slide, please, Emma. Um, two references that you might find helpful to um, to explore. Um, I hope um, I hope it's OK to mention climate outreach work. I know we're going to hear from climate outreach in a minute, but the Talking Climate Handbook is a fabulous resource for having those kinds of human level conversations. The Climate Psychology Alliance is also a great resource for understanding some of this psychology I've been talking about. And Ro Randall, Rosemary Randall, who's also mentioned on the slide, is the author of In Time for Tomorrow, which is uh, seven, six or seven years old now, but a really great book that, that explores the, um, the realities of trying to make changes in our own lives, which I think is also useful in the workplace. So I'll leave it there. Um, thank you all for listening, and I'm looking forward to hearing what my fellow panellists have got to say. Thank you, Rebecca. I feel like I've just been listening to pause for thought or something, you know, because these kinds of topics do give you so much to uh, think about, don't they? Um, if people have got questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but just in the interest of time so we don't cut our two other speakers short, we'll just move straight on and hopefully there'll be time at the end for a bit of a discussion or a chat, but if not, yeah, let's let's do it in the chat function. Um, Catherine, do you need me to share your slides or do you want to share your screen yourself? You're on mute. Apologies. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll give it a, I'll give it a go. Um, actually, yeah. If you don't mind the next slide thing, it actually probably would be a bit easier because then I won't be kind of looking looking down at the screen. So, um, if you don't mind, if that's if that's not a problem for you, not at all. Let me just. I've got it up. So let me share your screen and away you can go. Thank you so much. So. Um, uh, Rebecca's uh, presentation was so interesting. It's given me so much food for thought already. Um, just to clarify, I'm not part of climate outreach, but I am going to be talking about some of climate outreach's work. So I am the policy and communications manager for the Place Based Climate Action Network. Um, and if you just like to go on to the, I'm going to be talking about communicating behaviour change today. Lot, lots of of, of crossover with with what Rebecca's already said, just very briefly about um, the Place Based Climate Action Network, otherwise known as PCAN, uh, just to give you a bit of context what I do. It's a research programme about translating climate policy into action on the ground in our communities 
and we do this through a network of our climate local climate commissions and these are partnerships um, that bring together um, people from from the public sector the private sector and the third sector that includes local authorities universities um, the independent bodies that provide evidence-based analysis support and guidance and participations on a voluntary basis and their role is to build broader capacity to um, effect transformative change so that's a little bit about PCAN if we could just take the next slide and just I mentioned the climate commissions just to give you some examples of, of what we do so the original climate commission started in Leeds back in 2017 and I'm part of the secretariat for that and I lead on communications and engagement um, as part of that that led to the in fact the Leeds the Leeds commission was a sort of um, was the original one and we got PCAN after that so after that the core other core commissions in Belfast and Edinburgh were formed lots of other um, commissions have have kind of come on stream since I've got 16 there in the slide but actually I think it, it might even be more than that now um, not not that we've produced but that other other places have you know we've helped them or they've done it independently so we've now got a fantastic network of um, commissions and similar types of coalitions uh, place that are all place based um, around around the UK and, um, and the, the latest and the one that's taking up all my time now um, in a good way is the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission which is our first regional climate commission um, and that's a three-year commission and we're working very hard and there's a lot going on with that but I'm not really here to talk about that that's just kind of a bit of context about um, where I'm coming from I guess and um, the things that I'm involved with so if we could move on to the next slide please so there's just some examples here of some of the communications engagement work I've been involved with through the commissions the top left picture is from the Leeds Climate Change Citizens Jury that we ran in 2019 as part and that was actually part of the big Leeds climate conversation which you can see underneath so we worked with Leeds City Council on that and that was following um, Leeds's climate emergency declaration uh, we wanted to have a whole city conversation about climate change um, you know, and what we can do as a city so um, yeah those two are linked um, I mentioned uh, so the Leeds Acts Together campaign which you can see down there bottom uh, bottom right one of the recommendations from the citizens jury uh, that was a really important one to them was around climate change communication and education and they they came up with their phrase Leeds Acts Leeds Acts Together or Leeds Needs to Act Together and we used that as a basis for a, a comms campaign that um, Leeds Climate Commission ran last year and then uh, the other top right images from our Yorkshire and Humber Climate Action Plan which we launched um, this time last year at the Yorkshire Post Climate Change Summit um, all our work now is around um, is, is on how we can deliver deliver those actions those 50 actions in that climate action plan and obviously communication is a key part of that so um, those are some of, some of the areas of the work that I'm involved with or have been involved with around climate change and uh, engagement um, so if we can move on so I just want to talk a little bit about why behaviour change is is um, on is so necessary and important. And you know, some of this I'm sure you you will be aware of. You, I'm sure you're aware we have a, a global climate target to keep temperature rise to well below two degrees and preferably to 1.5 above pre-industrial levels. And that was from the Paris Agreement. Nationally, the UK has got its own climate targets. It's committed to 100% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, Prior to that, a 68% reduction by 2030. And where are we now? 2022, that's only eight years off. And that's rising to a 78% reduction by 2035. Basically, the bulk of the, the work, the heavy lifting, we need to be doing in this, you know, in this decade. And that's fast running out. Also, other places um, like Leeds, for example, have got their own even more ambitious targets than the national target. So, for example, Leeds has um, a target to be net zero by 2030 and as quite a number of other local authorities with similarly very ambitious targets. And the point about that is, is to achieve these targets, they, they do rely on significant public buy in. And if you look at the, um, the Climate Change Committee produced um, its six carbon budget, and, and, you know, basically about 65% of the emissions reductions to 2035 that we need to take all involve some um, element of public choice, you know, whether that's um, buying a new technology, 
using new technology like you know electric vehicles or adjusting habits and lifestyles um, you know those are around fundamentally kind of changing what we do or reducing demand and you know doing doing less particularly around you know eating meat you know, driving flying so these are all key areas of, of behavior change and when you look at how much of getting to that target relies on on that public buy-in and and degrees of behavior change that's why it's really really important now there's a perennial discussion going on of course um you know individuals can't do it by themselves and shouldn't be doing and be asked to shouldn't be asked to be doing it by themselves it can't happen without infrastructure support and policies crucially at the national and at the local level but of course you know a really key part of all of this is communicating it and engaging with people so if we can move on to the next slide so good communication and engagement are vital um we know there are very high levels of concern about climate change. We know that from all the all the public opinion polls that are consistently coming through. But having said that, I know that this from the stuff that I've done on the ground with people time and time again, there's a very wide variation in how far people are actually willing to change their behaviour um, and or support policies that would encourage those changes, you know, ranging from the kind of nanny state kind of arguments to actually when it comes down to it, they really like eating meat or, you know, uh, people always have you know reasons very good reasons for, for not for you know not wanting to necessarily go go along with those things so you know that's that's one of the dichotomies we face uh rebecca's already mentioned that you know like power and, and media campaigns and right-wing politics particularly against the cost of green policies that threaten um the transition to net zero we had one recently and the, and the liz trust uh, wouldn't support a public campaign to reduce energy demand for example um so we know that engagement to um, to build support for these economic and social transitions to decarbonize is really vital and the um, the Grantham Research Institute that's actually kind of linked with us a bit with PCAN has shown that um, you know information campaigns can really help the uptake of new technologies and uh, while changes involving significant behavior change need a lot of participatory and deliberative methods to foster those attitudes going back to those conversations and that Rebecca was talking about. Now, some of these local and regional interventions are things like citizens assemblies, um, and I mentioned that we've done one in Leeds, and, and those kinds of things really will be vital to ensure that people can really relate to the issues at hand. But um, for the same reason, interventions should recognise people's differences, and we need to tailor messages and um, the processes to suit different groups. So. Um, this is when we'll go on, I think, look at climate outreach work. So that's on the next slide. Yeah, so Rebecca's already already well mentioned the uh, the climate toolkit, um, toolkit for climate change and, and Brit so climate outreach is a charity that's been working for, I think, since 20, uh, 2004. It's based in Oxford and it's specifically its focus is on communicating climate change and engaging um, also over a whole wide range of uh, stakeholders on climate change. And they produced this toolkit, an evidence based toolkit in 2020 to support any organisation that wants to engage the British public on climate change. And the way it's done it is to build narratives that resonate with a wide, um, a diverse range of values and concerns. Now, we haven't got time to go into all this. I've done a summary here and I won't read through it all, but you know, I'll give you time to perhaps have a little look and you can follow the link at the top and, and download the toolkit. But basically the way it works is, um, is you know is looking at values and segmenting the um the population by 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 values and core beliefs and they come up with seven seven kind of segments um and you've ranging from what they call progressive activists which are you know, people who are really into it and care about it a lot very active and doing lots you know um, and you can see the whole list there and i think what's really interesting if you look at climate outreach's work is you know what resonates with certain groups and very much what wouldn't resonate with certain with certain segments as well and in those conversations about climate change that are really important to have totally totally get everything that rebecca said about listing well we'll, we'll go on to that as well but I guess knowing knowing how we can talk to people and know, knowing what the starting points could be in those conversations um, with the people within these segments is really important. So, as I say, um, there isn't really time to kind of go into all of this, but I think have a look at the work and check out the link. And 
I think being aware of who who you're talking to, as well as thinking about where we're coming from, that was just so interesting to to think about. But also the kind of messages that people are going to be receptive to or not receptive to, um, and how they see themselves in relation to the issue is just a a really important one to kind of look at. Um, so we go on to the next slide. So what have we learned about be communicating behaviour change? So this is some res some points from climate outreach and some that you know we've as PCAN have kind of really um, you know learned over over the over the years that I've learned over the years. You know the balance between individual change and systematic change are kind of you know it's not one or the other. They're two sides of the same coin. Uh, you know we need and we need to be pressing on both. But really important that we don't put it all on people and we don't blame or, or guilt trip when we're having those conversations and also it you know it's not about you you should be doing this we need to be you know stress the power of the collective and, and talking in terms of we um and also just uh, that that avoids that kind of finger pointing kind of thing but also the more that we all do the more effective our, our actions are going to be um the importance of collaborating for impact can't be sort of you know emphasised enough, um, you know, using the network, your existing networks and your existing contacts and also joining up with other organisations. And again, the point about tailoring messages to audiences, which we've just talked about through through the climate outreach work, um, using trusted messengers. You know, there are some communities that aren't going to, you know, they might not listen to you or, or me, but there are other people that they, they, they will listen to. And, and so, you know, knowing who to talk to and have those conversations with and when to step aside when to step aside is really important. I was at an event on Saturday and it was with young people and there were some adults there who really didn't know that they should be stepping aside and listening. And that is so important to do. Um, so, yes, listen and don't lecture or hector because you will lose your audience straight away and no one likes to be lectured. Uh, and also you don't need to talk about climate change. We, we were discussing we've been talking about a climate campaign all year. And it's very much pegged to a cost of living crisis and, you know, and really people saying, are we talking about climate change at all? We need to talk about people's everyday concerns and come at this from, you know, from this angle, you know, the climate benefits are there. But that's not what's important here. The conversation is about the everyday concerns people are having with the cost of living crisis and how making these changes yeah, yeah, they can help them. But climate isn't the priority for them. But, you know, the, the priority is managing your, your you know, your bills and, and getting getting through. And again, to to Rebecca's point about, uh, you know, the scientific deficit, you know, people just encouraging people to be ambassadors and not climate experts through the citizens jury. We had an amazing lady who didn't know that much when she started. And by the end of the process, she was interested, concerned, but she didn't know very much. By the end of it, she was on. Um, I've heard her recently. She's been on Women's Hour. She's been in national debates um, and she's giving us she a very straight forward straight talking point of view and she's fantastic and she completely cuts through and she wouldn't call herself a climate expert but she is a true ambassador um and context change and as we've seen and they're changing rapidly I, you know we can hardly keep up with what's happening now so i think that's really important and i think there's just one more slide if i've got time just quickly so yeah things have changed again cost of living crisis energy prices ukraine war competing narratives um, erosion of trust in national government, massive. Um, so, you know, we constantly need to be kind of looking at how we, you know, how we um, do we need to change our approaches. So Climate Outreach has done some some more work, which we really, you know, say now that the thing to emphasise is fairness and, and how crucial that is. And that means that people can have a meaningful say in how climate policies are designed and who should benefit. Talking about grounding communications in, in commonly held views, for example, that the less well off should pay less. And, you know, we've seen that with the popularity of the windfall tax and presenting the transition to net zero as an opportunity to counter unfairness. Um, and also raising awareness of the disproportionate impact of climate change on certain groups and in certain areas. And we know that um, those people who've done the least to create the problem are, are, are suffering the most. And we've seen the horrific climate impacts already in, in all over the world, but especially in places like Pakistan, where a third of the country went underwater. Um, and again, in terms of what resonates with people, positioning accelerated UK action as something we should be proud of. And I think that's interesting, perhaps a final point to, to leave us with, to think about. We've got a COP27 just about to happen in Egypt. 
there's been a very interesting um, debate about whether political leaders should be there and changes have happened as a result of that. And, and the UK was proud to call itself a climate leader. And, um, and it's interesting to see the pressure that's been put on government to actually attend COP and now they're going. So some pointers for, for you know, how things are changing and we need to kind of, you know, other, other ways of coming at these conversations. But I think that's it for me and I, I hope I haven't gone over time, but thank you very much for, for being here today and, and for letting me talk to you. No, that's absolutely fine, Kate. Thank you. Um, there are some uh, comments and questions in the chat that you won't have had a chance to, to read while you were talking. So if you want to to go back through and, and perhaps respond or just sort of absorb what people are saying, that'd be uh, that'd be great. And I will uh, do. Thank you. I will stop sharing and we can go straight into Ben, if that's all right, Ben. And uh, yeah, great. Can you see those slides? OK, yeah, we can. I have two ticks. Let me just get my notes up. OK, um, so I can't see teams properly at the moment. Um, happy for people to kind of um, make a contribution as we go along if they'd like to, um, but I can't see any hands or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'm here to make a bit of a prov provocation really. Um, so I'm Ben Tang, I'm the Digital Net Zero Lead working out of the Transformation Directorate. So our definition of net zero looked at decarbonisation and climate change adaptation. Um, now my question is perhaps more clearly stated as how can a focus on compound climate risks help us decarbonise and more? Um, so coming at this from a bit of a roundabout way, um, it's a bit of a, a whirlwind tour. Um, really keen to kind of get some feedback on whether people like this narrative or not. A um, bit about me, I'm a dad, 20 year sustainability professional, chartered environmentalist, sector economy person, founder of Cadence Roundtable. I've worked in digital sustainability for the last five years. Um, this comes with a bit of a health warning, so great that we've had colleagues from the CPA here and I think also a quick nod to the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission um, who, to my knowledge, done the first plan which puts resilience before decarbonisation, which is, I think, really powerful um, in terms of kind of messaging and maybe speaks to my points. I'm trying to make a bit here. So this was back in 2018. This will be new to none of you, I'm sure. Um, but I think the bit that I just wanted to pull out here is this is this bit about the unprecedented transitions to all aspects of society. And this is only gives us a 66 percent chance of meeting tipping points, relying on nets, which are generally unproven at scale um, and COVID and the Ukraine war and such like have really tipped us off track to do this. So how how can we create this level of decarbonisation? Is a huge challenge which has been spoken about a bit by Kate before in terms of engaging people. So just a quick look into my day job. So thinking about tech as a decarbonisation enabler, I'm not going to dwell on this slide at all, but in my in, in my normal world, I think about how do we manage down the carbon impact of hardware and software and how do we manage up the carbon benefit of digitisation and similar questions from a climate change resilience angle. Um, so clearly, Digital has a lot to offer in terms of decarbonisation, but we're not doing it. This isn't quite at, up to date, this graph um, only goes to 2021. 2022 was the highest ever carbon emissions for a year, rather depressingly. So we've not even turned the curve yet. Um, we had the half 2018 emissions by 2030 to hit that 66% chance of safety. Um, this is not a good news story. Perhaps we need to start thinking on a more precautionary basis here. Um, and this is where we start thinking about the climate emergency as a health emergency as well. So this is what we're heading rapidly towards, if we're honest, I think. Um, there was some bits in the chat around the more recent piece of work coming out of the, the Lancet. Um, but this this graphic we can see here has been used in published government documents before and is you know well recognized as a kind of summary of the health impact of climate change. There was a recent um, statement from the CEO of the UK HSA, um, I forget her name, but in The Guardian um, about the growing concerns around climate change 
as a health issue. So it's great that it's kind of getting that airtime at the top table now, um, and hopefully that means we can start to kind of really take a hard look at how we can start to respond to this. Again, in in summary of what does climate change do to the health service? What does climate change risk look like? This is um, a quick summary that I made. Um, again, I'm sure this will be new to none of you. Um, you've got all the direct impacts there around weather and climate, sea level, second order impacts. We might be able to shuffle some around between second and third. The definitions are a bit amorphous, I think, sometimes. Um, but you know, rises in disease, migration, scarcity, difficulties getting stuff, um, supply chain or utilities, infrastructure. And then those show up broadly in those two categories of third order impacts around increased population health issues, which the Lancet do so much work on, and then difficulty in terms of actually delivering our health service. So for me, this presents something of a manageable set of risks as it stands. Um, people are much more established at managing things like flood risk and stuff like that, but there's a, a ever growing number of people that are starting to be engaged in the subject of climate change adaptation and risk management. We have sets of obligations in place through things like um, green plans, green government commitments, um, the ARP process, etc. Um, and I, I suspect some of you will have had a look at the third health and care adaptation report that's there on the left hand side of the screen. There's a set of voluntary commitments that the health system has made to start to move towards a more climate adapted system. And there's some great work out there as well. So there's that references the World Health Organization's resilient climate resilient healthcare framework. So there's a lot of pre-existing thinking in this place and it also loops into things like EPRR um, and business continuity processes as well. I think what's what's missing a bit from this is how do we think about longer term climate risk management? Um, how does that change over time? The slow, it's the slow burn stuff rather than the business continuity things that are a concern. So just jumping back into my day job again briefly. So I think about as an underpinning requirement for tech to be a climate resilience enabler is that we must have climate resilient digital and comm systems in the first place. There's a whole field of study there. Some, there's some excellent literature um, and understanding of what that means. There's lots of work around critical national infrastructure. Again, not in the best place you might have seen in the last week. A big story come out, um, a report from a House of Lords inquiry into critical national infrastructures, climate change vulnerabilities. Um, and again, it's not a particularly good news story, but let's say infrastructure is resilient. Tech can provide us with a range of climate resilience benefits. So this is just a bit of a mind map that I pulled together to just kind of illustrate this point really. So they're not all health system specific, but hopefully some of them might be interesting to you. Um, so that that's the manageable stuff really. But now I just, um, I'm starting to get into the subject of the talk a bit more. So now let's start thinking about compound impacts and what that means. So compound impact equals complex risk. Complex is not predictable. It equals emergent properties. It equals lots and lots of interdependencies that, that will start to trigger different things happening and emergent outcomes that we can't necessarily forecast before they start. So Chatham House did the first piece of work that I've seen on this subject um, and they analysed several different kind of sectors um, and looked at how when you factor in these cascading or compound risks, how does that start to look like? And I've taken a bit of an aggregation of their work and pulled together this extended version of my health system climate risk flowchart, which becomes a bit more troubling. So this is a, this is my personal interpretation. I'd be very keen for any critical feedback or collaboration to improve it. Um, my conjecture is that 
it's questionable about how manageable this is anymore once you're factoring in compound risk. On a, on a high level basis, you've got this obvious multiplier between population health impacts and operational delivery issues. So if you've got twice as much population health problems and twice as hard to deliver, perhaps it's four times harder overall. So arguably the health system is in the kind of perfect storm of these two problems. But then when you start to look at some of those feedback loops that exist outside of the sector, um, those then feed back into many of those impact areas. So extreme event response will typically start to push up carbon, push up material use um, and therefore start to trigger more direct impacts. Um, you know, poverty could start to lead to um, more migration because you can't people can't get what they need, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see traces back into all of those other areas if you think that through. So overall, this becomes a picture of potentially spiraling problems. Um, and my take home message from this is that this is something that needs to be avoided at all cost and puts the health system in a place of some responsibility to start to kind of talk to this point of how urgent a problem this is for us. There are some organisations that are doing some interesting stuff in this space. So um, the IPPR um, and a chap called Laurie Laburn Langton there has um, done some interesting work around what does policy making look like in an age of environmental breakdown. Um, a bit like how the UN in their um, 2018 reports were calling for transformation of society and socioeconomic systems, they do too. And I think if you look at those three bullet points, it's it's good in that it, it joins disparate work streams in the health system. So it could join things like decarbonisation, health equality, prevention, levelling up, all of these things start to become wrapped up into one kind of bigger problem, which is great. I think one of the one of the real difficulties in working in, in really large organisations is the siloing off of things um, into like individual problem statements, whereas it's so important for us as sustainability professionals, if we're looking across the broader definition of sustainability to try and pull these, these pillars together. And I think there's a lot out there of people who are doing this already. Um, so a great example, I think the gold standard probably at the moment is the Capitals Coalition work, happy to be challenged on that. Um, there's some great examples there around from York, Yorkshire Water and Crown Estates who are looking at essentially integrated reporting or total value assessment for decision making. So how do you make sure that you're not just doing the best for your bottom line, but also the best for environmental and social outcomes as well? So the Green Book actually states something like 70 times through it that we should be factoring in environmental and social externalities into our business case options appraisals. Um, which is amazing and really hard to do at the same time, but righting the wrongs of the current system, the global economic system that we have that's driving much of the problems that we have. And then NICE have done some interesting work recently as well, looking at sustainability assessment within all of their policies um, and proposals and frameworks, etc. cetera. Um, so there's some good practice out there to build on, but the, the bottom line here is how do we start to pull many different sustainability issues so and not just environmental ones into the same space. Um, arguably the best recognised framework I think for this is the donut uh, of Kate Raworth Bain. Um, I suspect most of you will have at least know about this. If you've not read the book, I would thoroughly recommend it. Um, it's starting to get lots of practical applications now. Kate, who's on the call, I know is heavily involved in the um, the action lab that they've got, um, leads are starting to look at it, Cornwall County Council. There's many people that are starting to use this as practical decision making tools. And what it does really is looks at how do we look across a broad range of metrics to provide a social foundation without overshooting an environmental ceiling. So how could we do this within the health system? Um, what would our KPIs and metrics look like is I think a really fantastic question and one that I would love to explore with colleagues. And what it also does is starts to potentially help us solve the current, I think, slightly hidden paradox that we're working within um, of healthcare actually doing environmental harm, both directly in terms of the actual treatment and clinical facilities, etc., but also indirectly within society 
by increasing longer term societal environmental impacts made up of all the individuals out there. Um, so how do we, could we use these kind of processes to enable us to shift from healthcare outcomes being less bad for the planet to perhaps regenerative? Um, and then drilling down again, how could we manage down the direct and indirect environmental impact of equality down to zero or even positive? So there's an example of, you know, potentially jumping between metrics, of say carbon and healthcare metrics like qualities um, to start to link and de-silo some of this thinking. Um, so yeah, if anyone's interested in exploring the donut in a healthcare context, I, I, that would, I would be super interested. Um, and then the last bit I just wanted to finish with was a little bit about stories. So this is again going back into my day job um, to some extent. Um, and I think something that I'm really interested in is how can we utilise our work to tell deeper stories, not just so solving for certain problems like optimising for carbon or, or things like that, but how can we start to link it to stories that that go deeper towards some of the kind of more systemic problems for and systemic causes for the situation that we're finding ourselves in. So that Green Book example is an easy one. So it corrects for financial externalities. Um, in the in the digital space, the tech code of practice really is quite effective at de-siloing, providing a real dashboard of things that we want to measure against, um, which I find a really useful, a useful tool there. Um, in terms of equality in my world, that shows up as digital inclusion. Um, so how can we ensure connectivity and device availability, backwards compatibility, and that links back into the levelling up agenda. Um, and then we start to get a slightly more kind of deeper, I guess, decoupling economic growth from energy and material use. Um, here I use the example of circular economy. Um, so we can use any circular economy work that we're doing um, in my world, that might be creating multiple usage life cycles for devices, for example, which creates a big step carbon improvement. Um, but we can tell stories about that decoupling effect there. Um, and then another one, one of the really big issues that we face is how we are disconnected from nature and community. Um, we can link to that through the prevention agenda. So again, for me, that might be tech enabled social prescribing, for example. So I really think there's a, a huge opportunity here to kind of provide some kind of layers of the onion as to the work we're doing and why we're doing it, not just what are the surface problems that it's solving, but perhaps what are some of the deeper issues that it's alluding to as well. So yeah, I hope that's been really interesting for you. Um, love to find any collaborators. I think just as a kind of closing point, I think we we always have to remember that we work in a huge system with over a million staff with almost a unique reach into the whole UK population. So, you know, if if we could leverage that in some way, how, you know, it's almost endless how far we could go with it. So, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been of interest. Absolutely, Ben. Um, thanks for a very interesting presentations. Um, I always feel that on Teams, we are very much lacking a sound effect for the clapping that you would get if you were doing this in in face to face so yeah a, a, a big thanks to everybody um we've only got a, a few minutes left if anybody's got a burning question they would like to put to one of our panel speakers please feel free to stick your hand up um and while we're waiting to see if any hands are going up i'll just say i personally would be interested in exploring um the donut in healthcare, um, something I've been looking at as well, and whether whether that would uh, resonate better with um, than than our sort of standard green plan, how we put it together a couple of years ago. Um, so I think yeah, there's perhaps something in that that we can we can put onto the collaboration hub or something to see if we could get interested parties. Does anybody want to? Speak up, please, and and ask one of the questions that they've put into the chat. Hi Emma. Go for it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to be on the next diet, um, of your lunch and learn, so I thought I'd pop in and, and, and see what was going on today. 
three brilliant, brilliant presentations. Loved all of them. Um, sorry, I was late for the first one, Rebecca. But um, Catherine, I, I put a question in about uh, when you put in those different sort of um, typologies of people. I was wondering whether because I've I'd heard this um, this number of we, we only need 25 percent of any uh, society to actually change, to create change across the whole society. And I was assuming that that would be with the progressive uh, the progressive group that you the, of activists that you'd you'd highlighted. I was wondering if you could um, tell me if, if that is the case. Uh, hi, um, uh, Emma. I'm I'm not totally sure, but I'm I'm just looking at the slides from Climate Outreach from their toolkit when they break down the segments, and um, so they've got percentages. They've got percentages on them. And it's quite interesting. So the progressive activists make up 13% according to this. Um, then, yeah, uh, backbone conservatives, 15%. Disengaged traditionalists actually seem to be the biggest category, 18%. Um, and then loyal nationalists, 17%. Established liberals, 12%. Disengaged battlers, 12%, civic pragmatists, 13%. So uh, the progressive activists by themselves, that in, and based on that, um, and I'm not a statistician, <laughs> couldn't quite push it over the, uh, you know, uh, and of course it's not the activists that need convincing. You know, we don't, they're already doing so, so much. It's, it, it's, you know, how do we have these conversations with these other segments? I mean, particularly, I think the, um, the civic pragmatists um, are a good category to, you know, with, with a huge amount of sort of potential for being kind of, basically the ask around them is to kind of, don't be afraid to be a bit more radical. Um, you know, so it's who who we have the conversations with, where you can shift the dial, basically. And obviously, you know, if you're having a conversation with, um, you know, um, oh, I've lost my slide now. Just looking at their their slides. Um, yeah, you you know, you have to be very very careful with uh, with the the disengaged traditionalists. But you know, that's eighteen percent, so that's the biggest. So. Yeah, it's a way you can make the progress. And I guess, you know, there's going to be more. You can see those ones that are, you know, that are more like where you're more likely to be able to move the dial. But it's not that it's not important to have the conversations with the other segments as well. But you're likely to get more traction of that kind of getting that critical mass with the, some of these uh, these other ones. Um, yeah, so that's, as I say, not being an expert, but that's from from looking at their work. Thank you. Super. Well, about out of time unless anybody wants to have a final word um so yeah we always run run out of 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 time for questions and i think all of our lunch and learn sessions could 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 be e e easily double in in length um if anybody does want to connect and you haven't got the details for the people who who have presented today feel free to come via via me if you haven't got my contact details i'll put it in the chat but you could get me through eventbrite through the link that you you joined us to like i said our next session is with emma who's just asked that question about um on our banana tasters for the how bad a bananas game so um i do encourage you to come along um to that in two weeks time at this end uh that might move us on a little bit into the conversation about sustainability communications, behaviour change, and trying to get people to understand perhaps how their actions uh, mean something. Thank you very much for attending. Big thanks to all our, our presenters. Lots of food for thought for a Friday afternoon um, and hopefully catch up with everybody soon. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Bye. bye.